The Speaker, I can tell you that both initiatives will deliver more than what that last government attempted to when, for instance, they put out a $1 billion infrastructure scheme. Tēnā koutou, I'm Selwyn Manning and welcome to the last episode of A View for a, From Afar for 2022. Uh, and today, as always, I'm going to be joined by political scientist Dr Paul Buchanan who is going to examine these issues and they are, they are hostage taking, prisoner exchanges and how states establish back channels in times of conflict. Specifically, Paul and I will examine the following questions. How hostage diplomacy appears to increase, where authoritarians rise and are emboldened to challenge international norms. Also, how states use prisoner exchanges to establish two-way common ground. And we'll also look at how back channels can also be established through prisoner exchanges. And we consider it within the backdrop of this question, which is, is this what we are seeing in the Russian-Ukraine conflict. So, with that said, we'll also be looking at what dangers are there when warring opponents reach a deadly stalemate in the battlefield, in some ways of what we're witnessing in this conflict right now. So before we cross to Paul, here's an invitation to our live audiences. We would like you to please feel free to interact with us while we're live via YouTube in particular, but you can do so on Facebook as well. And YouTube is probably the best because it is gelling better than Facebook at this time. So there's a little bit of just relaxed kind of invitation there to you. But do remember, if you make comments and lodge questions, your interaction could be included in this broadcast. So right now we've got Paul lined up and we'll cross to him to discuss these very, very important issues as we in the uh, approach the end of 2022. Tanakwe Paul, how's it going there? Oh, oh kia ora. So I know it's going well, although I'm dealing with allergies because everything is in full bloom out here. And many of our listeners may not realize, but I live out in the bush and uh, on the western flanks of the Waitakere Ranges. And uh, it's absolutely glorious from an aesthetic point of view, but it's horrendous from an allergy point of view, because everything is in bloom. Uh, but I'm a bird guy, and what's nice is that uh, we've had successful uh, predator control efforts for the last 20 years that I've lived here, and the birds are back, native birds, some of the introduced species. And so, yeah, I was saying off camera that uh, the uh, bird song is truly wonderful, particularly in the morning. So. I'll take the good with the bad, but uh, otherwise, mm -hmm. heading, head, heading into the holiday season. And talking about good, Paul, you've got the football and you've got your team, Argentina, sitting there in the finals, poised. So what do you make of this? Oh, well, I won't wrap it on too long, but <laughs> let's just say that um, uh, this household uh, is an Argentine household. Uh, Messi, uh, you know, Lionel Messi, the number 10, 
is a god uh, here and anywhere Argentines congregate. And so uh, we're very pleased to see Argentina in the final. They're a very tightly organized, incredibly skilled team with him as the leader. Uh, I would have preferred to see Morocco in the final for two reasons. The first one, of course, what everybody's talked about is that they would be the first Muslim majority Arab or African country to make it to the final. And interestingly, uh, had uh, had they made it to the final, we would have had the first post-colonial World Cup final because Argentina is a former Spanish colony. Morocco is a former Spanish colony. Uh, or at least parts of it were. And so that would have been interesting in and of itself. Uh, I also think that Argentina matched up better with the Moroccans. Although the Moroccans, I watched the game today that they lost, but they played really well. This is high caliber soccer football uh, against the defending champions, France, who are no slouches. I mean, these guys are going to be yeah. trouble for Argentina. But um, we're banking on getting up early New Zealand time. The game starts at 4 a.m. And uh, I'll have my coffee ready. I'll put on my Argentina, Argentina jersey. Uh, because, you know, all Argentines abroad have a number 10 jersey. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I told, I, I told the, the, the boy that uh, I won't wake him up early. Uh, but he can be, feel free to come out and join me if he hears yelling and screaming. Uh, at the television, so we'll see. School school ends tomorrow, so if he if he wants to get up early, you know he won't be dragging in class. So uh, yeah. we'll see. You know it's good. Argentina needs uh, the Argentine people need a break. Argentina is not doing well economically, socially. It's the, you know the usual litany of corruption and crisis. Uh, and I don't know if you get a chance or if the listeners get a chance. Just do a Google search of, let's say, Buenos Aires or Argentina uh, crowds, or World Cup crowds. Uh, the day that Argentina won, so what was that, two days ago? It was Wednesday, ours. Um, over 100,000 people congregated in the center of Buenos Aires. And among all the songs, they have all sorts of songs about the national team. But for a full 15 minutes, they chanted Messi, this guy's name. I mean, as someone pointed out, just imagine being him and seeing the sea of humanity chanting his name. I mean, they, they think he's a god and he's playing very well, so I can see it. But, you know, I, t I told my boy, I said, man, I got to get you back to Argentina because you will never feel passion the way the Argentines do football passion. You know, you, you, you've got to live it. Uh, there's nothing that can replicate it in any Anglo society, not even close. And, uh, and that was a demonstration of it. I mean, I watched the video of that crowd uh, that a friend, an American friend sent me because he remembers me from university days. And he's like, yeah, Pablo, man, he, he's from Argentina. And so he got a hold of me and he goes, man, have you seen this video? You know, your people are nuts. And um, I said, yeah, man, that's the way to part. And I said, you know what's incredible about that crowd? They're not drinking. That's a sober crowd. Uh, you know, they're partying hard, but they don't need any intoxicants. <laughs> you know, I've already they're, got, they're I've already got the high. Yeah. Well, that, that's, anyway. that sounds um, absolutely brilliant. And that, that's um, really packaging it up for our audience to be on side and watching it through the eyes of the Argentinians. But like you said, you know, France is pretty slick, isn't it? You know, and it's um, they are. it's proven that to be the case in the past too. So what a game. Almost, I, I, look, I'm no, I'm no expert, but it looks like a, a game where two t totally different styles will be looking for supremacy. So that, that's how it appears to me. And look forward to that. Look, what we'll do now, we're going to just... Um, pull up what Reuters has released overnight. It focuses in on the uh, it focuses in on the um, on the impact, if you like, of what we are seeing in the news uh, in the Ukraine conflict, in particular in Kiev. And uh, I'll just run it runs for about two minutes, and then Paul and I will evaluate exactly what we have all been seeing in the last week or so. 
from that conflict and what it all means within the context of that questions and frame that we were talking about at the front end of the programme. So Russia launched its first major drone attack on the Ukrainian capital in weeks on Wednesday. Kiev said its air defences prevented serious damage. As the United States considers sending its advanced Patriot air defence system to help Ukraine. Mayor Vitaly Klitschko said explosions rocked a central district and two administrative buildings were damaged, but he mentioned no casualties. A barrage of Russian missile and drone attacks have pounded energy infrastructure since October. But Ukraine's grid operator said Wednesday's strike caused no further damage. An air raid alert was lifted three hours after it began. President Vladimir Zelensky said they were Iranian Shahid drones and all 13 were shot down. Local resident Natalia Malink heard a whir like a moped and hid under a blanket. She says Russian President Vladimir Putin is trying to wear down the people of Kiev. There are a lot of casualties, a lot of consequences. But we simply have to hold out. If we got help from the West in time, we could defend ourselves and shoot down drones as well as fight back. You see, they still don't shoot them down properly. It landed here somehow. I think he wants to suppress us psychologically. So people start asking for reaching an agreement on his terms. But no way. It's been eight months already. How can we give up after this? Paul, now that clip, I think, lays out very well a lot of the points that you've already explain to me off air that you'd like to explore. So I'd just like to hand it over to you and to, at your um, discretion, take us through this journey. Uh, sure, I guess, you know, what we can say is we've entered into an age of hostage diplomacy. And I think that we need to explicate that a little further uh, because, you know, the mass media has covered the, uh, the release of the American basketball player from Russia. And we'll get to that in a second. But Hostage diplomacy is actually a time honored tradition. It's a type of uh, coercive diplomacy mixed in with uh, public diplomacy or performative diplomacy, but it's fundamentally coercive, clearly. And what's interesting about this age is that in previous eras, what we saw was that weaker states would engage in hostage taking against stronger states, greater states, with something very specific in mind. You know, they wanted something, anything from recognition to uh, a specific material outcome, the release of a spy, something to that effect. What's different now in this age of mass communication and social media is that now strong states like China, like Russia, regularly engage in hostage diplomacy. Let's be clear, the Chinese have taken Australian hostages uh, because they're displeased with Australia's approach to the PRC. They've taken Canadian hostages uh, because they were displeased with the arrest of the Huawei CEO's daughter as she was transiting in Canada. And the Russians, of course, have done this over the years. And it's all because uh, these, these states perceive an erosion of international norms and rules, something that we've talked about at great length. And given that there's no enforcement capability on the part of the international community, and given that they do not want to escalate into all out war, then what they do is they engage in this sort of hostage taking. But they have specific items in mind. And uh, in this case, in the Russian case, it may have been an arms dealer. Uh, I mean, Iran is engaged in hostage taking as well. Uh, and so that's the, the what's grabbed the headlines in recent days, again, with this American basketball player. But the bombing of Kiev uh, and other cities, for that matter, is also a form of hostage diplomacy. What you're holding, you're holding the cities hostage. You're attacking their infrastructure. You're, I think the lady said it right. I mean, it's, it's designed to undermine the Ukrainians' government's 
a steadfast approach to winning the war, it wants to undermine public confidence. And what's interesting is this hostage diplomacy works very well in instances against liberal democracies. It doesn't work too well against dictatorships because they don't have the public opinion to deal with. You know, when you're an elected government uh, and there's, you know, partisanship, you know, the usual, you know, uh, you know, heave and fro, fro of uh, democratic politics, then the governments find themselves pressured on all sides to uh, secure the release of their citizens. And that's that opens up a strategic dilemma, because on the one hand, liberal democracies want to show that they are very concerned about the welfare of their citizens, uh, particularly their citizens abroad, uh, when put at risk. On the other hand, uh, by negotiating and then eventually agreeing to terms with a country that takes hostages, you may encourage similar behavior by them or by others. So you're really in a conundrum uh, doing so. The, the interesting thing is that there are costs to the hostage taking country. Uh, those costs may be hidden at first and they may be long-term in effect, but think of it this way. The, if you engage in, in hostage diplomacy, certain countries uh, or even private actors, let's say firms, may rethink their investment strategies and their diplomatic engagement with you because you're behaving in a rogue manner. I mean, I, I'll give you a, a, a personal anecdote that sort of illustrates this. I found myself many, many years ago in a more militant phase of my life uh, in a bit of trouble in Chile. And my father at the time was the head of General Motors and the head of the American Chamber of Commerce in Chile. And I got myself in some strife and I wound up being detained uh, for about 36 hours by Ch Chilean security authorities, a rather unpleasant lot. And my father came out and you know he was a well-known businessman in Chile under the dictatorship. These were the days of Pinochet. And he came out and he issued a press release and held a press conference. And he said, one has to rethink their investment strategies in Chile if the son of the uh, president of the American Chamber of Commerce, the son of the CEO of one of the biggest investors in Chile, uh, is arbitrarily detained and disappeared. Uh, if that can happen to him, it can happen to anybody. And we need to think, rethink this whole, this whole connection or something to that effect. I was released almost immediately after that conference. And it's because he was pointing out to Pinochet's minions that the shadow of the future will weigh very heavily upon them if anything happens to me. And the deal that was struck was that I would leave Chile, basically get deported uh, within 48 hours. You know, they gave me time to pack up and leave, and that's how they save face. Well, that's a variant and what we're talking about here. And getting back to the Ukraine, what we're seeing, again, as that lady pointed out, is Putin's strategy, their military strategy, is to try to secure some sort of battlefield concessions uh, by undermining the will of the Ukrainian people by holding their cities and particularly their energy grid uh, hostage. And that's the non-kinetic part of the war. You know, the big part, we're now entering into the critical phase of this war, which is can the attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure break the will of the Ukrainian people? Uh, and then in larger scale, will the energy uh, scarcities and the rest of Europe undermine the consensus behind NATO to support the Ukrainian effort. I happen to think the answer to both of those is no and no. The Ukrainian people will be steadfast. They will not turn on their own government to secure a ceasefire in terms that are uh, amicable to Putin's vision. And I don't think NATO is going to reward Putin's behavior uh, by bowing to the pressures of, let's say, the pro-Russian left or now the pro-Russian right in their countries. So 
we're, uh, you know, in a way it's collective hostage taking versus individual hostage taking, but these are both forms of coercive diplomacy. And the question here is, uh, how do you go about securing, you know, the, the safety of your citizens or, uh, you know, collectively or individually without prompting uh, the, you know, the, the hostage taking country uh, and others of similar disposition to then repeat it all over again. Uh, so there have to be costs to this. And I guess the question is, what were the costs to the Russians for engaging in this? I mean, I'm, I'm not so concerned about the arms dealer that went back. Uh, he was oh, yeah. a limited- so Just at, the, at this point, um, so it's clear we're moving into examining prisoner exchange, which has been high in the news in the last 10 days or so. It's been brewing for a wee while, so Paul's just going to take us through what that means, and he's already mentioned about the delicacies and dangers where a country like the United States may embark on this, where the other side of this coin, the hostage-taking um, country, if you like, or the prisoner exchange country on the other side of this uh, ledger, sees an advantage and escalates that type of thing. It's a little bit... Uh, a nuance there, and Paul will explain that for a bit. Now, let's just look at that. The prisoner exchange um, uh, exchange uh, dialogues that have been going on. Paul, what does that look like in reality? What does it symbolise in behind that as well? And does that lead naturally to the establishment of solid back channels between two opponents within a context of conflict? Well, we, <clears throat> when we conversed about this, uh, this show earlier in the week, uh, you made the very good point that this may actually be an opening, a diplomatic opening, uh, as well as being, you know, examples of collective and individual uh, hostage diplomacy, course of diplomacy. And this is how it, it works. I mean, all of this, strangely enough, is tied together when, particularly in the case of Russia, they're... Uh, so we know the exchange for the basketball player. Now, let, let's be very clear just before we move into the Ukraine. There, there's another American being held, you know, under trumped up charges, supposedly, in Russia, a guy by the name of Paul Whalen, an ex-Marine who uh, was a private security contractor in Russia, got himself in trouble and has been uh, uh, charged and jailed for some lengthy period of time for espionage. Espionage is a very serious charge. It's not the same as carrying hash oil in your luggage, which is what the basketball player got nine years for. Uh, that's a frivolous charge. And but espionage is that's a big deal. So the, the Russians are looking for something other than the arms dealer. They want something the United States has, you see, because in these games, there's only one buyer and one seller. You know, others cannot inter intercede. And so uh, I think that the negotiations over Paul Welling will involve spies, Russian spies, that are being held by the American authorities. Uh, again, a much more serious business than this hapless basketball player. At the same time this was going on, the Russians and Ukrainians, not once, but twice in, in recent weeks, have exchanged prisoners. And in the latest batch of prisoners released by the Russians, there were, I think, 60 Ukrainians and an American. And so the issue here, as you rightly pointed out earlier in the week and now on the show, is that perhaps in a time of conflict, when normal diplomatic relations have been suspended, such as they are between Russia and the United States, then hostage diplomacy is a double-edged sword in that, yes, it's coercive, but on the other hand, it opens doors of communication, avenues or pathways of communication for negotiations on a host of other things. And I think that's what's happening. I think that, uh, you know, again, the, the, the bombing of cities, the taking of hostages, that's, let's say, the, the militant marker. You know, that's where you're putting that out there and saying, you know, we can be very bad if we want to. And then you're looking for something more moderate, something in the middle. It's the old militant moderate strategy. And I think that a lot of this has to do with the battlefield situation 
that the Russians are confronted with. See, unfortunately for those of us who want to see the Russians out of Ukraine, the war is bogged down into a stalemate. And the West likes to trump up Ukrainian victories, but actually things have slowed down a lot. And everybody's waiting for the ground to freeze. I mean, literally, this is an old fashioned World War II uh, type strategy. The ground right now in eastern and southern Ukraine is really boggy. So even tracked vehicles have a hard time making any headway across open fields and that sort of thing. They've got to stick to the road system. And of course, they can be targeted more easily when they do so. However, uh, they're going into the hard freeze months where the ground freezes to up to a meter in places. At that point, you can disperse your armor and your artillery out into the open fields, into the forest and that sort of thing. So this stalemate may be both sides waiting for the ground to freeze uh, as if they were fighting 70 years ago. Uh, and so before we get to that next phase of the conflict, I think this phase, while there's a stalemate, is the opportunity for back channels to be used between both sides. And in the case of the Ukraine, its patrons, particularly the United States, to see if there can be a resolution, some sort of you know solution set, if you will, of objectives on both sides that can be mutually accommodated. I'm not not certain of that, but I think that's what's being this is what's being played at the moment. This is similar to <clears throat> this is what some of the evaluation, rightfully or wrongly, that uh, I was considering before the program. Overnight also there's been reportage and it's been big in the United States where the, the, there's a Russian commander in the field and he was speaking directly live to Russian audiences via television in Russia. And his message was basically that Russia, the military, the Russian Federation military, cannot successfully achieve its goals with conventional warfare against what he said was Western weaponry. And he added in there that, however that said, that Russia has at its, disposable, its disposal the nuclear response. Now this is obviously starting to escalate where you've got commanders in the field talking within that context. Do you see that as... A, either or either type of option, meaning singularity relating to response? Or is there a multi-layered approach to this that we can read into it where this message was obviously going to be picked up by the West and it gives Russian, Russian Federation uh, people that are establishing dialogue with the Biden administration through back channels and gives them some harder currency than perhaps... Uh, they would otherwise have. Well, this is certainly a multi-layered statement. I mean, there were many audiences uh, to which he was talking. And, and remember, in our previous discussions about uh, nuclear strategy, uh, we've talked about the fact that the Russian command and control system is quite decentralized. You know, they, remember I was saying they're more flexible than the United States. Uh, Putin can't just punch in some codes and have nukes go off. He's got to th go through the Army chain of command, the rocket uh, forces chain of command. And uh, interestingly, unlike the American authorities uh, or American military, uh, Russian field commanders uh, have uh, final say on the use of tactical and theater nukes. So hence uh, so the importance of, of, of this individual. Yeah, on that. Point. Exactly. Now, he's uh, unless this has all been pre approved, he's at some risk. For having said this, because he's Putin, Putin, he's placing Putin in a corner. He's saying, you know, we don't have the ability to resupply, replenish, and modernize uh, against the, you know, the Allied West. I mean, they're they're now hurting us badly. We can't do it on our own. No one's coming to our help except for the Iranians and their drones. That's not enough. And uh, again, if Putin didn't approve this message, knowing that the West would see the threat in it, then he may not be happy with this commander and think, no, I needed this like I needed a hole in the head. 
uh, you talking about nukes out of turn. Um, I think it was orchestrated so that Russia can say to the West, look at you know what our command and control structure is. You know that we have these hard, ha hardline hawkish commanders who in desperation, seeing that their forces are being decimated by your advanced weaponry, have the ability to launch a nuclear strike in theater. They won't be doing intercontinental strikes, but since tactical nukes can be fired out of, you know, howitzers, you know, as artillery shells, but still have the punch of a Hiroshima bomb, um, that's, that's a serious escalation. And Why don't we a, talk? There's an element of, of resistance to advancing this from a tactical nuclear question, I guess. We've touched on it in the past, that when the West built up this type of capability in the Western Plains, or, or all those plains between the West, NATO countries, and the Russian Federation, or private, pr prior to that, the Soviet Union states, republics, that the weather was basically the advantage that the West had. If it was going to launch a tactical nuclear uh, manoeuvre, that the fallout would go eastward. Is that still the case with respect to the weather and the patterns that we are seeing within the theatre of conflict in the eastern side of Ukraine? Is it an advantage for Russia to launch such an attack, or is it going to come back like an umbrella that folds in the wind, unfolds in the wind? Uh, well, I mean, you, you sort of hit the nail on the head. Uh, when I hear these pronouncements, I mean, I realize, okay, this is, again, this is public diplomacy uh, of a course of sort. You're now threatening to use nukes, you know, expressing concern because you can't keep up with the West. But uh, you're absolutely right. The uh, You use a tactical nuke anywhere in the Ukraine, but certainly in eastern Ukraine. And the radioact radioactive fallout will drift into Russian territory and uh, will irradiate uh, anything that it touches. Now, maybe Putin doesn't care about his citizens in southwestern Russia. You know, maybe he just doesn't give a darn. Uh, but I think he just might. <laughs> that 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 sort of uh, uh, backwash, if you will. Uh, would um, would be calamitous for him. Uh, yeah, you know, he may be despotic and uh, and whatnot, but he um, he will have to calculate public opinion in Russia. In fact, uh, uh, there's a well-known academic here in New Zealand called Robert Patman, an yes. <clears throat> international relations. Salute to salute to Robert Patman's work. Okay. Yeah, Robert 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 Patman is good value. And he made a very, very good uh, observation a few months back. He said, uh, Putin may be delusional, but he's not suicidal. And I think that's exactly the case, is the chances of Putin allowing a tactical nuke, or much less a theater nuke, uh, to be used, knowing that uh, the radioactive fallout of even a relatively small burst will drift into Russia suggests to me that this is more public posturing. It's demonstrative course of diplomacy on the part of this commander, and uh, but doesn't really have real intent uh, behind it. You know, this again is, and it goes back to your point. Uh, this, this is another marker being put out on the militant side to open space for back channel conversations. Uh, exactly. about the collective and individual hostage taking that is now going on. So right at this point, it's actually a really good point that David Mooring, a regular on our program and a regular commentator as we're live, and I'll just bring it up on screen so you can read it as well if you're watching, and I'll read it out for those that are listening. David Mooring says, using nuclear weapons would be suicide for Putin, uh, since there would be no backing down. Putin himself would become the effective number one world wanted war criminal. So there's, this is the other angle to it, isn't it? You know, from the point of view of that's relevant, that last part about the world number one wanted war criminal happens when 
the conflict is over. If anything ha- shows us from history, no matter how embedded and how destructive, is wars at some stage do end. And this is the element that would kick in after that. But whether or not it's a consideration right at this time is, is the question, I think. And I guess I brought that, um, that comment up by David Mooring because that's the other element to this. But perhaps it's a consideration that kicks in at a, at a juncture that's in the future as opposed to now. Am I right in my evaluation of that? Uh, yeah, and thanks to David once again for a, you know a thoughtful question. Uh, I have slightly different takes, Ellen. There, and it's interesting. You know, I mean, I'm not going to say great minds think alike or dislike, uh, but a few days ago, I was saying to my political science wife, my uh, my wife is a political scientist at a local university. I said, you know, what I find incredible is that um, the Russians are bombing civilian infrastructure and targeting cities that have no real military value. Now, I personally believe, um, being sort of old school in my views of warfare, that bombing energy grids in a time of war is a legitimate military target. It's a form of psychological warfare because it does you know, work on the will of the people being targeted. In this case, I don't think it's going to work, but I'm willing to give the Russians the benefit of the doubt and say, well, you know, it's war, you know, wars are unpleasant. But what I was saying to uh, the political scientists in my house is that I'm very surprised that uh, no one has tried to charge Putin and the Russian commanders with war crimes because of the targeting of the cities. And again, places in the cities like the overnight bombings, the drone bombings that we've heard about today that have no military value. You know, they're residential districts and that sort of thing. Why have those commanders not been you know, charged with war crimes? Well, the political scientists in the house said, because it's a form of leverage. Course of diplomacy is all about leverage. And so if you charge them with war crimes, then they've got nothing left to lose. You know, they know that anything short of total victory will result in them eventually, you know, being being shown the dock uh, and probably going to prison for a very long time. And I think, yeah, she's she's absolutely spot on on that one. This is all about leverage. They're laying off of talking about the consequences for Putin and his entourage. Uh, until the war is finished. And that, uh, and that may or may not result in an outcome that's favorable to Russia. I tend to think not. I tend to think that this is going to become a war of attrition where w- Western weapons on the one side will favor the Ukrainians, but uh, the weakness of will of Western citizens will favor the Russians. Because I have a- see it in the US Congress uh, with the Republicans coming into the House, there is a uh, a block of those MAGA types who are pro-Russian and are agitating to have the U.S. stop supplying Ukraine with advanced weaponry and uh, financial assistance. So and just you can already that, see for the audience, I'm sorry to jump in, but for the audience, that what Paul's talking about here is the supply of money that would pay for those, that the House of Representatives controls that flow. So this is why it's significant that these Republicans are trying to actually stall that. So I'll just back out of that comment, Paul. No, oh, good point, good point. So, I mean, the Russians are hoping that the Western resolve will begin to fracture as a result of the energy crisis in Europe and then partisan divisions in places like the United States. Uh, I, again, I tend to think that the supply of advanced weaponry will continue, um, albeit maybe slowed down, and that will favor the Ukrainians over the long term. But this is becoming a war of attrition, uh, not so much a death by a thousand cuts, but certainly you know a lingering death on one side or another. And returning to the original uh, point is that in pauses in this war of attrition, you have you you have the moment to sort of reconvene and try to approach via these back channels. Prisoner swaps are excellent. Uh, These individual swaps, not as much, but they can lead to avenues of negotiation over other, you know, in other themes or other areas. And that's where I think we are. 
I mean, I think there's a lot of quiet diplomacy going on between the United States and Russia. Uh, if you notice, the NATO, the civilian NATO leadership have been very hawkish uh, about Russia. You know, they're not being conciliatory. Um, in fact, they're talking about, you know, throwing the Russians out of the Ukraine entirely. Uh, we've never seen that level of hawkishness in uh, the post-Cold War era. I mean, they're the Europeans, you know, the military Europeans and civilian security officials have really got a hard line on this. And I have a feeling that they're the hardliners on the West. Russia has its hardliners, including this theater commander with nukes. And in the middle is the United States negotiating a more moderate position to see, as we've talked about in the past, if he can offer a uh, Putin an exit strategy that allows him to save face. Mm. Um, you know, again, we've talked about this since the beginning of the war. Uh, you've got to leave him and out. It's unpalatable. Uh, but if you want to see a peaceful resolution, uh, the, you know, without lingering for years, uh, then he's got to have an out that allows him to say that he achieved something. And I don't think that right now, at least publicly, uh, either the Russians or the Ukrainians are disposed to uh, do that. You know, the Russians don't want to be given an exit strategy and the Ukrainians don't want to give it to them. So uh, quiet diplomacy using these back channels may be the best way to sort of feel out the opponent and see what's achievable. So with, with news reports in the public sphere coming out in the last two days from the United States, that it looks like the United States is moving toward uh, providing Ukraine with Patriot missile defence systems. Is that it edging and countering the Russian uh, escalation of rhetoric around, rhetoric the right word? You'll correct me, um, around this? And it, it, or is it an either or thing? Or does it escalate the dangers of a more decisive, destructive response from the Russian Federation? Well, it's it, it's interesting. It harks to uh, uh, oh a broader construct in uh, in strategic thinking. The broader construct is that for every offensive weapon system, there will be a defensive weapon system developed to counter it, and then there will be an offensive weapon system designed to counter the defensive system that has just been created, and so on and so forth. Okay, it's a form of strategic dialectic, if you will. Well, this is what we have right here. Um, the Patriot missile systems are defensive uh, missile systems. They have small charges because they're designed to knock down things in the sky. So you don't need a very heavy warhead. And uh, so they do not pose any sort of existential threat to anything uh, but the flying object that they're being aimed at. So the Russians don't have to fear the javelin, excuse me, the, uh, the Patriot, um, uh, attacking them on the ground. Uh, I have no doubts that if the Patriots are introduced and they're now being introduced mainly for these Iranian drones, uh, the Iranians have shipped over apparently over a thousand of these drones uh, that are being launched from Crimea and so have very quick air times before they strike targets in, like Kiev. And their design, I think, to overcome them, you will notice that the Russians are using their fixed wing attack aircraft rather sparingly. Um, they're preferring, you know, long distance weapons like cruise missiles. They don't want to expose their pilots to what is already a very hostile airspace. And so I think, yeah, what will happen is the West will supply these, those drones will start getting knocked out in large numbers. And then the Russians will come up with something that can overcome the uh, Patriot defenses. And they, the Russians make very good missile defenses themselves, or excuse me, anti-aircraft defenses themselves. And so uh, I don't think we'll be seeing uh, the Ukrainian Air Force in large numbers once the Patriots arrive, because right, the Russian concern would be Patriots arrive, knock down a bunch of stuff in the sky, and then the Ukrainians swarm. Uh, I don't see that happening because the Russians have plenty of anti-aircraft uh, defenses, both against missiles and fixed wing. And so uh, this is just another application 
of the strategic dialectic. You know, bringing in a system to overcome an offensive system, and uh, the Russians will find a way to overcome the Amer American supplied defenses. So you mentioned there the significant amount of <clears throat> missiles that are being launched from the Crimea. Do you see that? What does that say to you? Do you feel that that is a clever move by the Russian Federation in this respect, that the Crimea is obviously a prize for both sides? So one could argue that it would be less advantageous to Western interests uh, should it be an basically destroyed by a retaliatory attack on that on that era, area. And is, the, is Russia using that as some sort of um, cloak, if you like, or protection mechanism, knowing that that may be the case? And that consequently protects other major cities that lie closer to um, the Black Sea and uh, the, the Sea of Azov, uh, where there are significant cultural hubs and, and cultural, uh, um, sorry, I should say economic hubs. And, and cultural and commerce uh, locations that it would need as it withdraws potentially from this conflict. There's a couple of things in there, um, but that's strategic, and I just wanted to see what you thought. Yeah, again, it's all about leverage. I happen to think that the use of Crimea as one of the main launching sites for the Iranian-supplied drones uh, has clear, you know, tactical advantages, you know, to it. But there's also uh, a, a sucker ploy involved. And that's because the Russians are adamant that Crimea is a part of Russia and has been for a long time. Uh, we know all the historical arguments pro and con. And I think what the Russians are doing is inviting the Ukrainians to launch large scale attacks on Crimea, because that will justify Russia's expanding the war into Western Ukraine and saying, okay, you're taking now something that we will never negotiate. And we are now going to raise the cost to you by doing what we've done so far, but expanding it all the way to the Polish border, uh, the Romanian border. I mean, you will you will pay a very big price, and it's going to be exacted. The blood will uh, exacted will be of civilians uh, because the Crimea is non-negotiable. I think the Ukrainians understand this, and what they've done in return is they're now attacking. Uh, weapons, fuel, and even food supply routes in southwestern Russia. They've, they've struck deep into Russian territory. And what they're doing is they're going after fuel depots, again, weapons depots, railroads, uh, the highways connecting bases and whatnot, um, in order to starve the Russians of weapons, munitions, uh, and, and again, even food. So, so we're talking logistic and supply line necessities for an invading force. So exactly. Just yeah. Cut them off in the cold and uh, their troops will suffer non-combat losses. I mean, you know, there are a lot of bad things happen when people can, can't eat. Uh, their fighting spirit tends to wane. So I think the Ukrainians are, are, are signaling to the Russians that they can reach out and touch them inside the homeland, but they're not going after civilian centers. They're going after legitimate military targets and they're avoiding large scale attacks on the Crimea, understanding that this would be an escalatory uh, 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 move that the Russians would have to respond to. And, and, and also so I'd suggest at that point that Ukraine would lose the support of the West, particularly the United States, very quickly and by degrees if it started to actually be aggressing toward civilian uh, targets within the Russian Federation territories itself. Oh, absolutely. Well, no, they shouldn't do it. I mean, they, you know, they do have the ethical high ground uh, mm -hmm. in this war. They, they should not squander that. I thought you were going to say that the U.S. would not support a large scale assault on Crimea. Um, and that's and, part and I, of it, is it? Yeah, part of yeah, the question here is. Yeah, I think the, the Americans are of a mindset that they're trying to tell Ukraine, look at if we can negotiate a Russian withdrawal from the Donbass region in exchange for them getting to keep Crimea, let's do it. Let's do it. 
you know, and I think that's the American position uh, quietly being whispered to Zelensky and his advisors. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think the Ukrainians are in any mood to admit the legitimacy of any Russian claim. Uh, they feel they can win this war, and uh, but they need the Western weapons to do it. And so far, NATO has come to the rescue. Again, the U.S. now has partisan divides. And that, of course, harks to the psychological warfare that's going on over everything else is Russian disinformation, you know, directed at American audiences, European audiences, and vice versa, for that matter. Uh, and so it's very possible that the Ukrainians at some point, if the stalemate continues in, well into next year and beyond, that then they'll have to consider uh, giving up Crimea in order to regain their territory in the east. We're far from that, though. I mean, that's why the back channels are about the best solution right now. Short term solution is keep the avenues of communication open, even if they're precipitated by some form of collective or individual hostage diplomacy. And in the midst of that, see if they're again, they can arrive at solution sets that allow the Russians to exit with some degree of honor, not that there's any left, but also will satisfy um, Ukrainian ambitions about their territorial integrity. So Paul, this program is the last that we'll be doing for 2022. And we'll come back in 2023 in a format that shoulders on top of what we've been doing, no doubt. And you and I will talk through that and see what you think has been working well and how we can apply those and focus in. So with that in consideration, we'll be off air for, you know, for a time, maybe a month and something like that. We'll, we'll come back to our audiences oh, yeah. when, when we come back. There's going to be a lot that happens between now and then. What are some of the pointers, without trying to put uh, Nostradamus on your shoulder, Paul, but uh, mm. what are some of the pointers that the audience could perhaps look out for um, to see and test themselves? what is happening and how things are tracking in this conflict? Well, I think that the the, the most vital one um, next year will be unrest in China. I have a very strong feeling that the unrest in China is not going to go away, even though they did the reform mongering that you and I spoke about a few weeks back. But I think, you know, the cat's out of the bag on that one. And uh, we shall see, you know, because if uh, Xi Jinping's authority is questioned further, he may try to stage a foreign diversion, you know, stage a conflict with somebody that he thinks he can win uh, in order to divert people into nationalist, you know, and, you know, aspirations and that sort of thing. Basically, what we saw with the opportunity of the Falklands War all those years ago with Margaret Thatcher starting to feel pressured back home embarks on a response to the Falklands question. Um, the conflict occurs, national interests soar, and she wins decisively in the next elections. So we're just talking you know, about that it, kind of thing, aren't we? You know, but with respect to China. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's a, it's a time, another time honored tradition. The, the irony here is that uh, the Argentine generals gifted Margaret Thatcher that war because they were attempting to rally nationalist sentiment around the Malvinas because they were faced with growing unrest. And again, they were a hard dictatorship, but they were, uh, they were in an economic crisis. And there was the popular protests, you know, when they, they bang pots together out of windows in yeah. apartment buildings and that thing. That was going on, and so these these fools, uh, I'm talking about the Argentine generals, decided, well, we'll we'll take those islands back. So gifted who was that? it to Gal Galtieri in those pool. Yeah, Galtieri. Galtieri yeah. was the uh, the president at the time, uh, and uh, yeah, he was. He had just succeeded Videla, who was the president during the worst years of the Dirty War. But you know, these are the, these are generals who made their name killing civilians in the Dirty War. Uh, they had no clue how to fight a peer military 
especially one like the British. And although the Argentine Air Force acquitted itself very well, um, neither the Navy, which basically hid in port after the Belgrano was torpedoed, nor the Army on the ground uh, behaved rather honorably, except, of course, as always, uh, the sergeants in the infantry who were left to lead their troops when the Argentine officers fled as the British fleet approached. I mean, again, the, the, the things that happened on the Argentine side are a lesson in uh, you know, military corruption and perversity. Well, uh, moving beyond the historical anecdote, we have protests. I, I see this as a precarious moment, that is 2023, because I don't think the protests in Iran are going away. I think that now people are protesting the execution of protesters. And so I have a feeling that even though the regime has, uh, has also reform mongered and it, it says it's going to go disband the morality police and go light on the hijab edicts, uh, they could well be lying. And if they're lying, they've miscalculated and those protests will continue, which will undermine uh, their legitimacy, such as it is. And that's, I think, the general theme. Um, you know, I feel I feel a little weird as we enter this holiday season because it hasn't been a good year. And you and I were talking off camera. I, I'm particularly disturbed by the fact that here in New Zealand, um, you know, the anti-vaxxers are still around. They've moved into QAnon, deep state theories, and they're, they're not going away. Uh, they're being mainstreamed by right-wing parties. So you're starting to see their rhetoric, rhetoric percolate in parliament and what have you. And it, it just gives me this sense of malaise above and beyond my family's personal circumstances. You know, we all have our trials. And, and I got a feeling 2023 could be worse. Um, I certainly would like to see the theocratic regime in Iran uh, replaced. I'm not going to say overthrown. I happen to be a student of revolutions and very little good comes from revolutions. You get a replace, you replace one authoritarian regime with another. Uh, but I would like to see the Iranian regime at least moderate in light of the protests. I would like to see the PRC open up or better yet, she removed from power and a more moderate successor uh, designated, I don't think that's going to happen in 2023, but I think the shaking of the tree of power in those countries uh, may occur. And then in Russia, uh, I think the biggest danger to Putin is not in the Ukraine or Western weapons and whatnot. I think it's uh, his own people. I think that as this war drags on, uh, that group of 500 that surround him, what are they, the Slovaki, uh, if I got that name right, I probably did not, but his enemies are there. And in the measure that you have now have commanders, if this, this command, the theater commander's comments were not orchestrated from the Kremlin, then you just had uh, a rogue military officer talking to the Russian public about how basically if they don't use nukes, they're going to lose the war. That is not in the official Russian, uh, you know, playbook. And so I think, you know, we could see the beginning of a protest movement in Russia once the true scope of the losses in the Ukraine are revealed. And remember, it's something we talked about on and off over the past few months is in an age of social media, you can only censor for so long uh, on some people, but there's always ways for communications to come out and be distributed. They pop up, they get shut down, they pop up, they get shut down. I think Russia is not immune from that. Iran is not immune from that. Uh, China is not immune for that. And so I guess the optimistic side of my thinking is when we get to this time next year, we could be seeing the fall of these authoritarian regimes, or at least you know their internal uh, transformation where moderates begin to push out the hardliners because the hardline approach is causing too much domestic unrest. It's an interesting thing that comes to mind, and I'll conclude the program unless we want to come back on a couple of points there. And it's a cultural one. You know, way, way back when the Cold War was in existence, a British singer, Sting, who came to fame through the 
band police, of course, with some amazing rhythm d- drumming that came from a guy, Copeland, from the United States. But putting that aside, Sting had a song when he was soloing about the Russian situation, and Reagan was in power at the time, and the key line in the song was, he hoped that the Russians love their children too. Absolutely. What we are seeing is the answer over the period of time, time and time again, is very much they do so. They love their culture, they love their country, and they love their children, and like all of us, sometimes the population of an apparent aggressor are as much victims as, as those that are suffering from the military response. So i just add that, and uh, it's a humanitarian kind of observation, and perhaps as we exit this year, it just balances out it to those that think that we are looking at things from one side, that the Russians themselves have much to, to lose should things go wrong, and that would be a shame on the world if it did happen. Um, Paul, I'll just put it back to you, and then we'll conclude. Yeah, I just point out, uh, you brought up Stuart Copeland. He uh, went to high school with my youngest brother nice. in London. Yeah, my parents relocated from Argentina and Brazil up to London. Uh, I, was, I was off at university, but the youngest kid of the six of us uh, went to school with Stuart Copeland and uh, uh, knew that band when they were playing high school gigs. Cool. Uh, so that's the personal anecdote. Look, at, I, I, I was thinking as you talk, I was thinking, you know, in, in, in a weird way, we may be seeing the beginning of the end of uh, certain types of authoritarianism, not limited to those three dictatorships. And I was thinking of the analogy that, you know, democracies, it's like a slow, steady burn. And there are flickers from time to time. Let's say the January 6th was a big flicker in the States. And you have protest movements and whatnot, but they seem to have this self-regulatory capacity to keep you know the fire burning steadily whereas authoritarians are sort of like a sparkler you know one of those fireworks sparklers yeah they they flare and then they go out and i think in this age of social media technologies the days of long-standing dictators you know enduring authoritarians even those of a one-party nature right, because it was the sole party that offered the institutional reproduction, the succession issue, all of that came because of the one party. Again, Singapore is the best example of that. The PAP, uh, you know, has now multi-generational in nature. It's about to move away from uh, the Lee Kuan Yew family and into, you know, other members, but it's a, it's a one party dominant state, but they at least pre- pretend to be democratic at some level. They hold elections, they do that sort of thing. And as authoritarians go, um, they're pretty soft. You know, again, I lived there for four years. I've lived under hard dictatorships and they definitely were a much softer version than guys like Pinochet and what have you. And that's where I'm going with this. I got a feeling that the days of hard authoritarians are being overcome by the diffusion of information across the globe that cannot be controlled by government censors. You know, it's direct between peoples of country and peoples within countries. And so I think that maybe next year on an optimistic note, we're seeing the crisis of long-standing authoritarianism. Uh, Because if we think of Russia, Iran, and uh, the People's Republic, Iran's been around since 1979 as a theocratic regime. Yeltsin's regime was chaos, but Putin's been around for 25 years. He's been on the scene. Uh, And then the Chinese have a 70-year history, but they've hardened up as of the mid-1990s. You have to think about, you know, the moderate reforms that were done after Tiananmen Square, where there actually was a reform-mongering project, but that eventually reverted, and then under Xi has become a hard authoritarian project. I simply don't think they can last as long as they used to because of the advent of these modern communication technologies. And so my bias for hope lies in that, uh, strangely enough, lies in social media. You know, we tend to see social media as, you know, uh, fomenting, you know, conspiracy theories and alt-right weirdness and whatever, and it certainly does that. Uh, But on the flip side, 
maybe it's doing, it's a force for good in places that are under authoritarian rule. It's a force for evil in my mind here in liberal democracies. But maybe that's the other side of the record is uh, used against authoritarians. It can actually promote transparency, if not democracy. And if that's true, then in my mind, that's a good thing. So on that point, on that position of hope, let's wrap this up. So once again, to those that have joined us in our live recording of this podcast, thank you very much and thanks for your contributions. And uh, some of them have been uh, very, very on the, on the mark. So we appreciate that very much. And you would have seen some of those on screen for those that are watching coming up throughout this program. And uh, we very much appreciate that. 2022 has been a good one for Paul and I with the view from afar. We've been evolving it. Um, we've been able to reposition ourselves and it's been a great project and a great challenge and we, we uh, have enjoyed it. For those that are listening to this on demand, thank you for your support. That's been absolutely marvellous to see those numbers increasing, albeit uh, incrementally. And uh, we uh, look forward to coming back in the new year, 2023, <laughs> um, with, with a new season and start the episode clock once again. But for now, it's episode 25 of season three, the third year we've been going. Thank you very much. Let's enjoy the peace that this season brings, even if it's within the mind and the concept. And uh, be kind to people that are out there. I don't like saying things like that, but I think it's a good way to end a program like this. And uh, thank you to you, Paul, um, for your expertise. And uh, we'll um, definitely uh, be... Uh, benefiting from all of that um, as we ponder these big issues. So, a view from afar, thank you very much. We look forward to your company next time we're back, back on air. Um, until that time, ka kite anō, take care out there. <laughs>